welcome. Uh, my name is Keith Marzullo, and I'm the Dean of the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this joint uh, University of Maryland High School and ALA lecture series. We established series in 2019 from our side through the good work of Ann Weeks. And uh, the idea was to provide another venue for the ALA leadership to talk with researchers, educators, and practitioners of library science. Um, we're really delighted to be partnering with ALA to make this happen. The series has had a bumpy start because you might remember 2019 was right before COVID. And so we were going to have one when COVID hit. So even though we started it then, this is only our second one. The first one was held last year with with Julius Jefferson giving the presentation. And we found out that the virtual presentations work very well because we record them and so on. Speaking of which, this is being recorded. I need to let you know that. Um, so thank you once again for joining us this afternoon. And it's my delight to introduce Dr. Ursula Gorham, who is the director of our MLIS program here at the University of Maryland. Ursula. Thank you, Keith. And I'm thrilled that all of you are able to join us for tonight's event. As the director of the MLIS program, I try to keep a pretty close eye on what's happening in the field. And the past year has certainly had us all engaging in important and often challenging conversations about digital inclusion, intellectual freedom, and other issues that lie at the heart of what we do. And I have no doubt that tonight's conversation is going to give us even more to think about and to talk about. So I am honored to introduce Joe Thompson, who will serve as moderator this evening. Joe, an alum of University of Maryland's MLIS program and a current member of our program's advisory board, is the Director of Public Services for the Carroll County Public Library in Maryland, and has previously worked in library administration at the Hartford County Public Library in Western Maryland Regional Library. He is currently serving as the chair of the ALA's Committee on Legislation. In addition, his past professional experience includes serving as president of the Maryland Library Association and president of the Reference and User Services Association. It is also my honor to introduce Patty Wong, current president of the ALA. Patty, who is the first Asian American to serve as president of ALA, has a really amazing bio. And so I'm just going to include a few of the highlights. As an active member of ALA for 37 years, she has served as an at-large counselor an executive board member and held numerous committee positions, including chair of the budget analysis and review committee. Patty is a member of the Freedom to Read Foundation and as an ALA executive board member has worked with the association's intellectual freedom committee, committee on legislation and the conference committee. In her day job since March 2017, Patty has served as a city librarian for the Santa Clara City Library in California. During her 34 year career, she has held positions throughout California at Yolo County Library, Stockton San Joaquin County Public Library, Oakland Public Library, Berkeley Public Library, and Oakland Unified School District. Her work in managing change, equity and diversity, youth development, developing joint ventures and collaborations between public libraries and community agencies and fundraising has been published in a number of journals, conference proceedings, and edited collections. Ms. Wong is also an adjunct faculty member at the iSchool at San Jose State University, where she has taught hundreds of students since 2004 to serve young people and write grants to benefit local and regional communities and make the world a better place. And last but not least, Patty is also the recipient of a number of awards, including the 2012 ALA Equality Award, the Member of the Year Award in 2012, and the Distinguished Service Award in 2014, both from the California Library Association. And like I said, those are just the highlights. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Joe to run the show for tonight. So thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Ursula. Thank you, Keith, for organizing this event and the, and the invitation. It is such a joy to be here this evening, and I see lots of uh, familiar names in the uh, attendee list. So thank you, everyone that's joining us in the live event. Thank you, everyone that's watching this as a recording later. Um, 
for, for the live event, we are going to be accepting questions and we're just going to use, simply use the chat. So if a question comes to mind during the, the, the event, please go ahead and enter that into the, the chat, um, chat box. And um, I will monitor that from time to time and uh, either ask the question during um, our interview with Patty or um, um, hopefully find time at the end of the, um, the Q&A. So Patty, it is such a joy to have you uh, with us this evening. Thanks so much for, for taking time out of I know what is a very, very busy schedule for you. So thanks for being here, Patty. Thank you so much, Joe. It's, it's such a pleasure. And, and thanks to Keith and Ursula for their warm welcome too. It's great to be here, especially um, among such a, a prestigious group and wonderful students. Excellent. Well, let's go ahead and, and dive in. I know we have a lot of questions here, and we did receive some questions ahead of time from uh, um, tonight's registrants. So first, um, I think it's fair to say that we're both pretty passionate about the work that's accomplished by mm -hmm. members in associations like ALA, but also in local chapters like the Maryland Library Association, the District of Columbia Library Association, and Virginia Library Association. So would you be able to talk about how you came to be involved in ALA and what opportunities you sought out that led to your current role as the elected president of the association? Thanks, Joe. And um, what brought me to ALA actually is a series of, of local um, engagements. Um, when I was, a student, I actually spent a lot of time with the California Library Association. So I totally agree with you that um, um, even as a student, I was very engaged with my local, um, my uh, state chapter, um, working on a lot of anything from conference to fundraising and um, all of the members there made me feel very welcome. Um, but I became a real groupie for ALA actually when I, um, in 1983, when I came to accept um, the, my a scholarship on behalf of the association um, at the annual conference, and I was hooked. Um, a couple of people come to mind that really helped shepherd and shape that experience. One was Regina Manudri, who became president of ALA in 86, 87. Um, she really, I came to actually work for Berkeley Public Library under, under her leadership, and I was, um, she just really made me feel at home. Within the association, I actually, uh, became somewhat of an intern for her um, while she was president and sh and actually when she was immediate past president. And that actually paved the way um, to really understand how associations work um, and to really become familiar with the good work that they do for on, on behalf of all of us. Um, another leader that helped me was, um, was Linda Perkins. She was uh, president um, of ALSC, the Association for Library Service to Children. Um, and she was our children's coordinator. And so I really got a, a, a strong um, and deep engagement in association work and the good work that we always can do together. Um, I've worked, I've done a lot of work. Reforma was my first home within the, now what we call the National Associations of Laborers of Color. I did a little bit of stint in, in, um, in CERT and our feminist task force. Um, and then the Chinese American Librarians Association and the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association. So committee work has always been important to me. Um, sometimes I was that person who was just really interested and actually asked the committee chair if I could audit and just take a look and just, just listen in. And I, I recommend that actually to students mm -hmm. to try that. Um, it's, it, but I think you have to find a, a place where it's passion, your passions um, are satisfied and where you can make the biggest difference. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, in addition to being um, a member of council for quite a few years and being involved in governance, I also became um, a member of several presidential advisory committees, often becoming chair or core chair, helping them establish their policy. And so that was a real way of actually shaping some of the um, policies and the, and the leadership and the, and the services that we see today. Excellent. I think that's some very good advice for, for those of us that are maybe interested in getting involved in these kinds of mm -hmm. associations, but maybe haven't made that, that next step yet. Mm -hmm. So I do want to ask, too, what advice would you have for students in MLIS programs who are interested in contributing to this kind of association or professional work? Absolutely. Well, I think one of the things I mentioned earlier is that I had some really great mentors. I think you need to seek a mentor. 
um, and, and actually be a mentor, pay that forward too. Um, I know that um, our students have a wealth of, of experiences to share, so don't hesitate to do that. Um, everyone can be a leader, go with your passion. Start, I believe, with your, with your local or regional um, library leadership, and, and then actually um, then move on to your state chapter. The state chapter has so many uh, resources, and they're always looking for in interested individuals to get active. Um, if you're not sure, as I said, you might go to the, you know, you might check in with the committee chair so you can audit for a little bit. So you get a little bit of an idea. Um, um, one of the things to, to be aware of is the process in many um, local chapters, uh, state chapters, as well as ALA as an association, is that the president elect usually makes the appointments. So if you're interested in something, please fill out the, the volunteer form, of course. Um, uh, but actually, you might, you know, the, the president elect gets a lot of um, a lot of different uh, uh, emails, and they're always very eager to hear from students because um, ALA, among many other of our um, library associations, we're always looking for student voices. They represent um, what's happening in the field at a very primary level. And we're always looking for interested individuals to come and join us. So um, don't forget to become a member of your, of your um, student association. Um, your student chapter actually in your LAS program is a really fantastic way of gaining leadership and engagement opportunities. Um, understand the role, do your homework. Um, I always spent a lot of time actually doing this in pairs with a, with a friend who wanted to try something out. Um, it, it, was, it gave me a little bit of confidence and, and also I had a lot of fun and, and was able to engage with others. Um, uh, be committed in the work, I think, you know, um, to, but pace yourself, don't overdo it. A lot of times, you know, studies, um, I shouldn't say necessarily studies come first, but oftentimes they do. And, but, but there is so much to learn from our community and the LIS profession as a whole is very eager um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to lend their, their, their thinking, their leadership and, and to support you, um, but also very interested in, in, um, in what you have to contribute as well. Excellent. And, and just one other thing I wanted to add is I know that the discount for joining ALA as a student member is much reduced and that's a great opportunity. And even many of the chapters have an arrangement with ALA that you can join both at the same time and get, and you can multiply that discount. So, so if you're a student, please consider looking um, online on, I know it's on the ALA website for information about how to join both your, your chapters such as Maryland Library Association and um, ALA as a student at the exact same time. Thank you. Fantastic. So I, I know you've already mentioned here uh, that you're a member of several ALA professional affiliates, including the American Indian Library Association, the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association, the Black Caucus of ALA, the Chinese American Librarians Association, and Reforma. Um, can you talk about how your participation in these affiliates has informed your approach to librarianship? Absolutely. And as a plug um, for our um, our, our organizations that are known uh, as a group now as the National Association of Librarians of Color. I did want to actually put out a plug out there. Many of them either have reduced uh, student membership or no student membership fees at all. Um, I, I, I encourage you to become members of all of them um, if you can and, and if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> how I got uh, uh, involved in the first place is that I found a welcome door there. I um, I found people who looked like me, um, who had common experiences and um, who valued my voice, um, who were interested in mentoring me and um, uh, encouraging me to grow and develop. Um, <clears throat> long before EDI was a core value and we had language and, and vocabulary around that, um, our, our associations of color um, really provided that second home for me in a professional way. Um, not only the cross mentoring that happened, but actually activism. Um, and I was able to put uh, together, we wrote grants and um, developed opportunities for um, students like myself and, and then incoming um, uh, <clears throat> graduates to really take place at the table and, and not only become leaders within the association, but to implement some change. 
um, to create programs that were welcoming to um, to others that really actually um, provided um, <clears throat> leadership models, um, different kinds of programming. And some of them actually did a lot of uh, regranting. So there was opportunities for us to um, explore some of that good EDI work actually within my own um, my own libraries, wherever I happen to 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 work. Um, the 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 big difference I think at the time, and and it, but I think is is it's ALA is changing along with many other associations. Is that the commitment to equity as part of our agenda? was very purposeful, was very strategic. We were designed, um, and some of us are in the 40, you know, have been around for 30, 40, 50 years now. Um, that activism that happened at the local level uh, was really critical for me in terms of uh, my growth and development. Um, but it also gave me um, the purpose to, to bring some of those ideas and the good work within equity and diversity and inclusion back to my home institution and actually um, specifically at ALA. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I did wanna mention is that my work within APALA and CALA, APALA, the Asian Pacific American Librarians Association and the Chinese American Librarians Association led to the first conference, joint conference that preceded JCLC. And, um, and through that, I th we learned a lot um, it was one of the first times those two groups had had, um, had a conference together, and it really set the stage for the successful JCLC that we know today. Well, Patty, thank you for sharing that that history. And um, we do have another question here that's about equity, diversity, inclusion, and, and that's asking if you can talk mm -hmm. more about your work and ALA's current work advancing EDI initiatives. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I really want to um, to give Sing high praise for is um, is our executive director at ALA, Tracy Hall. Um, she has really done a fantastic job of inventorying all of the EDI framed activities within the association. Um, brought that to our executive board, brought resonance to that, elevated that work. Um, the work has been ongoing. Um, before her arrival, but really what she's been able to do is really advance it um, and um, identify inclusion as an imperative. Um, one of the key things that happened recently in January, 2022, ALA Council approved the adoption of the diversity, equity, and inclusion, the DEI scorecard for library and information organizations. It was created by the Committee on Diversity, which is under the umbrella of the Office for Diversity, Literacy and Outreach Services. Um, and it's got five suggested scorecard measures, which are critical for organizations if they're doing evaluation in the work to create that sustainability. The first is, um, are they embedded in, um, is EDI embedded in the culture and climate of the organization? The second one is about training and education and how we can make sure that that's sustainable and inclusive and also routine. So it becomes a regular practice within the association. Um, the third one is about recruitment, hiring, uh, retention and promotion. How do we make sure that our institution um, has a commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion um, and make sure that we hire um, and recruit maybe even change our, um, our job descriptions to make sure that equity is actually first and foremost within um, uh, the work that needs to be done. Um, is EDI budgeted as a priority within your institution? And then the fifth one is data practices and how we evaluate and collect that data about how we're doing and, and making sure that we are always on top of how we incorporate EDI in our work. Um, Beginning this fiscal year, ALA will also adopt a maximum three-year cycle for comprehensive EDI training and education for all ALA staff. So one of the key things that Tracy has actually committed to is actually not only making sure that you know, we, we um, shop this out, but that we walk the walk, that we have the internal infrastructure for the work. Um, in fiscal year 2020, in this fiscal year, ALA has also begun to implement a policy to ensure inclusion of BIPOC and or individuals with disabilities in the candidate pool for posted ALA positions. Um, other, other efforts, uh, we have announced that um, we're gonna hire our first accessibility officer by the end of fiscal year 22. 
That's a big step for us. That will be a resource not only for internal needs within the association, but for our members as well. Um, working with the Office of, for Accreditation, um, the Committee on Accreditation, and Elise, our executive board has directed the executive officer, uh, um, office rather, to support the introduction of EDI as one of the metrics in the accreditation review process by the end of fiscal year 23. So what that means for our students and our LIS programs is that for the first time, we're going to be looking at the, at the standards and that COA is really on top of this already. Um, and, and actually looking and, and seeing how we front, how we frame EDI purposefully in the evaluation of our LAS programs through curriculum and through faculty and student um, recruitment and retention. Um, as well, uh, we are going to be instituting uh, for the study of race of, in libraries and information technologies as part of the Center for the Future of Libraries. Um, as you know, that, that it's an evolving um, agency. We've, we've had um, that group for, for quite a while, but we haven't done the research um, or the data uh, gathering really to study how race in libraries has made a difference. And um, so we're looking forward to that. The, the work will be carried out by a designated center scholar to be announced this spring. Um, we're also pleased to announce a one-year residency program to serve as ALA workforce pipeline for early to mid-career LIS and other associations professionals interested in LIS or association management. Um, there are so many things that ALA is doing and, and I'm very happy to be part of it. I did want to mention one last thing, which is, you know, of course, our spectrum is having a doctoral fellows of color. We're so excited about that. Um, and then the other two other things that I wanted to leave with you, which is um, one of the things that Tracy is leading, which is we're very proud of actually is, is we're updating the services to incarcerated and detained populations that hasn't been updated in 30 years. It's long overdue, but one of the things that uh, we're doing a little bit differently is we're not just at updating um, the standards, but we're actually bringing um, practitioners of practice together to talk about um, prison and detainee services, and especially looking at across the board, not just adults, but also services to immigrant populations and so services to, to youth. Um, anyway, that's just a highlight of the things that we're doing as an association and uh, we're so excited. Thank you for that great question. Thanks, Patty. Lots of good work happening in that area. And I do want to just point out that if you haven't opened the chat yet, um, there's a lot of helpful links in the chat. So thank you to everyone that's uh, contributing those, those links there as well. Thank you. So um, we're going to shift gears just a little bit here. Um, we have some questions. Um, about censorship, book banning. Um, many of us across the library community are very concerned about the rise in attempts yes. at censorship across school and public libraries primarily. Um, a few weeks ago, we celebrated National Library Week and ALA launched the new initiative, which is called Unite Against Book Bans. Um, would you be able to talk about the purpose of this new initiative and what it sets out to accomplish? Thanks for that great question, Joe. Um, um, to fight these censorship efforts, ALA has launched um, Unite Against Book Bans. Uh, it's a national advocacy campaign to highlight and mobilize widespread public opposition to the banning and removal of reading materials from libraries and schools. This research-informed campaign will provide information, resources, and actionable measures to strengthen a national grassroots network and empower individuals and groups to take action in their communities and in their states. ALA continues to provide direct support to libraries and educators who are addressing book ban requests in their communities and schools. And then, um, so Joe, I, I know that maybe another question um, that might come up is, is what the current and major sources for book banning initiatives might be in the US. Um, over the years, ALA has been gathering data um, through the Office of Intellectual Freedom um, about book bans. So we've learned that nearly half of all requests to ban or restrict a book come from parents. So that's 39% in 2021, or from library users, uh, about 24% in 2021. And they're most often directed at books available to young people. So what we're seeing now, though, 
is a rising number of requests to censor books from organized groups. So it, it was 10% in 2021. It's the result of a coordinated, well-funded, national censorship campaign by partisan advocacy groups that are targeting our public schools and our public libraries. Those advocacy groups are encouraging local chapters and individual members to attend school and library board meetings and demand the removal of books that do not match their moral or political beliefs. So it's re really a political effort. As a consequence, an unprecedented number of book ban attempts have been reported to ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom in 2021, with the Office of Intellectual Freedom tracking 729 challenges to 1,597 separate book titles. The highest number of book challenges reported to the office since it began to collect data 20 years ago. So that's a lot of, of activity. Uh, nearly all of the challenge book challenge books are written by black authors books that reflect the lives and experiences of black persons indigenous persons and persons of color and books centering the lives and ex and concerns of lgbtqia persons especially those books that speak to the lives of gay queer and transgender youth in addition to direct demands um, to censor books in local schools and communities we're also concerned about these groups' efforts to change state laws and local policies to, in, to better enable book censorship and to support the election or appointment of pro-censorship board members to school and library boards. They are also encouraging elected officials to call for censorship of school and library materials. Um, that's kind of a synopsis of what's been happening. It's very sobering, actually. Um, I encourage everyone, please, uh, join us um, and, and you can easily sign up at U Unite Against Back Book Bans. Um, I think you will find it um, to be it, its core to what we represent mm -hmm. in um, intellectual freedom. The right to read is critical to, to our work as, as, as incoming library professionals and, and our students, um, but also um, its core to the values that we represent at ALA and as professionals. And, and I, I can't help but just emphasize the, the power of um, the, the work that's being accomplished at the Office for Intellectual Freedom. Um, it makes me proud to pay my ALA dues knowing that, that we have professional staff, really experienced staff that are there and able to help local libraries as needed with uh, any local challenges that they are, they're facing as well. And that their contact information is easily found on the ALA website as well. So just kudos to, to them, kudos to you for, for really providing all this support. And um, I really, really look forward to um, seeing all the great things that come out of the new um, United Against Book Bans initiative. And please, I encourage everyone to please sign up and, and be a part of it too. Thanks, Patty. Thank you, Joe. So, you know, uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to also mention that some people may be a little hesitant to call or to connect with OIF. Know that the information collected is confidential. They do not share those lists with anybody. They make track, they track um, the numbers. I will tell you though, um, I currently have uh, an issue myself and I called um, OIF right away, got great assistance. Remember that their team is not only trained um, but they've had experience with similar books, um, you know, and so there's a repeated pattern around all of this. They give it great advice and we have an attorney in that office. So it's a very, um, it's a great um, uh, resource for all of us. And definitely, Joe, this is where ALA, your membership actually goes to support the good work of OAF. Thank you. Yeah. So, um... The, the ALA president does an incredible amount of work to advocate for libraries during their year in office, as I'm sure you know, and they often help to coordinate a common message for the association. Um, thank you for all you do. I, I know I, I follow you on Facebook and know that you're all uh, out and about and um, doing lots of things. It seems like you probably never get a chance to have a time uh, moment for yourself. Um, but I do wanna ask what advice you have for us. What are your key recommendations for those of us who maybe haven't been actively engaged in library advocacy, but we know we wanna get engaged. We know we wanna make a positive impact. 
for libraries? What can we do? So that's a great question. There are many things to do. Um, write a letter to your local editor of your paper, extolling the good work of your local library, whether that's a public library, school library, academic library. Um, attend your local library's board or governance meeting. Um, it, get involved, and, and it doesn't have to require a lot of time, but your local communities um, actually need to know that you're supportive of their work. Um, they need to know your viewpoint too, and they need your help so you could, as you get used to um, what we've seen a lot of, um, a lot of our local library um, staff actually is become active in the governing bodies of their local, not where they're working specifically, but actually their neighboring library or their neighboring school. Um, it, it really makes a big difference. Um, talk to your local public library director about ways that you can get engaged and involved. Um, become familiar with your local school library for support. Um, every state chapter usually has an advocacy or legislative committee. Find out a little bit about them. Um, sometimes, you know, if you don't want to get involved right away, um, audit for a little while, as I suggested earlier. But, but one of the key critical things is that um, they will actually assist you in, in figuring out um, not only how to get involved, but how legislation works in the individual state. It's very different in every different place. Um, how you can advocate, how you can um, testify uh, on behalf of, of your local schools. Remember that our school librarians actually have a really strong need for our support everywhere in the country, not just, um, you know, and, and so, and um, not only are they, um, uh, uh, the support is needed for, for them around the censorship issues, but a lot of our, our states actually, and, and local regions do not have um, credited accredited um, school librarians on staff. So they also need our support to know that that credentialing is so important. Um, and they need, we need our school librarians um, at the, um, to, to support um, our youngest learners. Um, volunteer to be a contributing meet, um, member of any committee um, that might meet minutes, especially, you know, I think our, our students actually um, have a, sometimes they, do, they have a time limit. We understand all of that, um, but it's great to actually um, uh, become involved um, and being a, maybe even asking to, to, um, uh, to be part of that mentoring engagement within their, within their community locally. Uh, become a member of your local friends group. Um, volunteer to sit on your library board. Um, volunteer for your local adult literacy program if, if, um, if you have an interest in that area or your youth services team. Um, uh, become a member of ALA that, that, um, and of course the, your, your local um, state chapter. Um, contribute, consider contributing to the Leroy Merit Fund. Um, that's a fund actually that's a little separate um, that supports those that are having financial difficulties um, if they are engaged in censorship efforts. Um, that's another that's another way. Um, the sky's the limit. Um, it's really, uh, but we we need all of you actually to be active in whatever way, shape, or form that is um, easy and convenient to you. Um, and and know that your local LIS programs actually have lots of opportunities for you to give back to your community or even give now as part of your student chapter. That's a lot of fantastic advice. Thank you, Patty. And I did want to point out that um, Kathy Cromer, who is with us um, as well here, she's the director of the um, Public Policy and Advocacy Office in, in DC. So um, she and her staff are doing amazing work monitoring a lot of the activity that's happening in Washington and across the, uh, the country. Um, she's provided the link to sign up as an ALA advocate. And uh, when you sign up as an advocate, you'll get messaging um, that's uh, local to, uh, to, to your needs in your district but also um, that are of national in interest. And just one example right now, um, um, we are working towards encouraging support across the Senate for fiscal year 23. Um, we have, uh, there's a zero appropriator letter out there. And just having as many senators sign onto that as possible really helps. There's a letter in support of Library Services and Technology Act, LSTA, 
and innovative approaches to literacy IAL. So that's federal legislation that directly impacts state and local libraries. So there's just so much you can do. And that just involves sending an, an email or, or a tweet. So it doesn't take a whole lot of effort, um, but really you can get involved as Patty said, at so many different levels from sending a message like that to joining your local friends, which is usually a, a fairly inexpensive um, um, membership fee as far as I've been aware. And, you know, all the way up to showing up at board meetings and of course, you know, going to the state capitol or going to Washington and actually meeting with your elected officials in person. So there's so many different ways to really make a positive difference. Thanks, Patty. Thank you. So we do have a question here um, about uh, trends. Just what are some of the current service trends and libraries that you're following and you're most excited about? You know, COVID has actually created um, a different kind of way of libraries responding to the needs of our community. And I, I really am excited about um, libraries thinking about the needs of their communities in a different way. Um, several libraries have become entrepreneurial incubators. So when many people had to think about recareering or different job models and they weren't, or they made a choice um, actually to, to develop their own uh, businesses. And a lot of libraries actually have become foster, uh, foster a lot of um, great work. Um, they offer space, but they offer different kinds of resources and of course, um, uh, um, access to all of those different kinds of models that, so libraries is in entrepreneurial incubators. Um, I think one of the things that's also happening is a lot of resource sharing like Sora. One of the, um, Overdrive offers uh, lots of libraries the opportunity to actually extend their subscription at the public library level to their schools for no cost. And so that resource sharing actually and that modeling makes a big difference. Um, another thing that's happening, resource sharing, um, that's, that's, that's exciting. And I'm sp speaking mostly from a public library level, but there's all kinds of different things that libraries across the country are doing. Um, our local library, um, our state librarian in California just um, uh, worked out a really great deal with, um, with our state parks program where they offer free passes to, to libraries. Um, and, and it was another way of actually increasing the equity and diversity and inclusion within the community. So that we are now partnering with local agencies who actually are there to lift up parks and natural environments as accessible places. Um, because what we know to be true is that a lot of our underserved communities did not find parks as welcoming. Um, and so we're creating um, kits that enable um, our communities, especially those who are underserved, to actually have stronger access, but to be able to feel comfortable in a, in a very different environment. And especially because they don't have to pay, that parking pass covers parking as well as attendance. So it's really encouraging um, families and other groups of people to actually um, engage. Um, some of the, so one of the critical things is that libraries are doing is having stronger conversations also uh, within, within their communities about EDI and what it means to be um, an, a community that's interested and involved in equity, diversity, and inclusion. What can they do? Um, libraries are now leading some of those conversations and engaging in a way with their communities um, to have brave conversations about some pretty hard topics. Um, and that in turn actually uh, creates a stronger organization. So I'm really excited about all those things, but there's so many more things. Um, one of the cre critical things, and I'm so glad that you brought up um, uh, uh, the Public Policy and Advocacy Office and the good work that we're doing in Washington. One of the greatest things that's happening also is our policy core group that's going through there, where our librarians are becoming stronger advocates for their work through some deep intensive training. And they're coming home back to their state chapters and making that difference. And we're able to actually have our, our um, local policy core members actually train our, our um, local boards and regional institutions at the very levels that where those boards um, and friends and those trustees really need that, that key information to be able to pass that advocacy on. Um, and in turn, we're, we're training actually the whole staff to be advocates in that respect and to, to be facilitators in the conversation. 
and and if I'm right on this, I believe uh, Ursula is a current member of the 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 new cohort of the ALA Policy Corps. So, um, mm -hmm. if you have any questions about what they're learning about, I'm sure Ursula would be very happy to talk about it. So. Um, we have a question here about sort of what do you wish you would have learned and is there one thing that you wish you would have learned about when you were getting your master's degree um, that you only learned about later? So this is many years ago because I'm, you know, I've been in the field for 37 years. A um, couple of things. I, um, the difference between outreach and engagement, I think, was something I wish I had spent a little bit of time developing. I think we were very focused on outreach and, and going into our respective public institutions, but not really delving very deep in terms of what their need was. Outreach for us meant, um, you know, attending farmers markets and, and going to your local schools and having good, uh, good um, introductions to library services, but engagement um, now actually I think is a stronger word for some of the work that we're doing about um, uh, about really being that resource for our community, um, embedding the work, sometimes directly working with partners to deepen the work throughout the community. And what does community building really look like? Um, I think, I don't think we could really have taught this as well, except through experience, especially through the pandemic is spinning on a dime. What does change management really look like? How do we allocate resources differently in times where um, really we can't carry on the same way we've done before. We, we really need to reinvent ourselves um, and become much more responsive to what our community needs happen to be. And we don't always have a lot of time to do that. So some of the prep work in terms of really engaging with our community, finding out directly who our partners are, who's doing similar work to us, how can we deepen that work? Hmm. That's, that's you know how to do all of that preparation. Um, I wish I, we had spent a little bit of time talking about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Well, um, we do have a few questions here from the registrants that were sent in before um, um, today's session. But I do also, for those of you that came in a little bit late, we are taking questions from those of you uh, who are attending this live session. So please feel free to just simply use the chat, uh, type in your question there, and uh, we'll, we'll ask as many questions as we can. So um, Patty, you're going to actually be here in Maryland next week. It's, it's now here. So um, I, I understand you're coming to our Maryland uh, Library Association slash Delaware Library Association conference. Uh, can you talk about what you'll be doing there? Absolutely. Well, I think one of the greatest opportunities that I, I have as president uh, was to really meet in person with, with a lot of our constituents and, and to really get a feel for what's happening and what's important um, to our, our local chapters. Um, and I, I, I'm very blessed to be, have been, uh, been com coming to MLA DLA um, next week. Um, I'm going to be spending time actually um, talking to uh, as many uh, members and, and would be members as possible. Um, and also um, concluding uh, with a, a wonderful conversation in the, on the evening of the 5th with Nate Kepler, who is um, uh, a president of MLA. Um, and we're going to be doing a little bit of similar things to what we're doing now. It's going to be a very strong conversation. We'll be taking um, questions from the audience. But I think one of the things we're going to be talking quite a bit about is, um, is not only um, uh, censorship um, and, and what's happened in the field, but also the importance of, of ebooks and, um, and the good work that actually Maryland is, is kind of taking through. And you know, we wish that there had been some um, different outcomes, but I think no matter what, what's happening is that state chapters um, like Maryland are taking really um, a strong voice and activism to really create uh, legislation that's going to protect and encourage um, uh, resource sharing um, and and equity uh, within those within those resources for all, and that that's that's amazing. Um, and it you know that um, almost you know as as state chapters, I don't know that we're used to actually coming forward with legislation of our own. We oftentimes are responding to legislation, but it's it's remarkable and so admirable 
that Maryland is is doing that hard work um, and approaching it from different ways. You know, it, it, it the outcome right now is this, but you know, I know that there's still work ahead. Exactly. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. We have lots of amazing people here in Maryland. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Maryland is often referred to as library heaven for good reason. We have lots of really smart people working on this particular yes. issue of looking for fair, fair practices for, for lending ebooks through libraries. So um, thanks. And thanks. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person ne next Absolutely. week there too. Um, so we do have a, a couple more questions here from, from the registrants. First one, uh, we'll, maybe we'll try to do these uh, sort of rapid fire style. Um, okay. What are the current ongoing ALA initiatives that will strengthen support pre-service librarian preparation programs? So the Spectrum Scholarship's emphasis on leadership development and matching scholars with mentors who are leading in the field, that's one. We have surmised that this is one reason why so many scholars are now in executive leadership roles. And then the Emerging Leaders, of course, program re replicates this model. But PLA also has a program that works with high school age students through career internships. Um, and so uh, there's, there's lots of opportunities there, I think. And I, I know that a lot of LAS programs are doing some good work as well. Great. And next question, how are libraries being reimagined or revitalized in use of their buildings as well as online or virtual services? And how are these being funded? Well, you know, our, our Build America's Libraries Act, while it didn't necessarily um, move forward, it created a whole rack of, of states that we're now activating in terms of looking at our building infrastructure. Um, the, our California model, uh, we have one called Build, Building Forward Library Infrastructure Program. It's based on $5 billion worth of need. And how we were able to do that is actually, we, we asked our libraries to advocate and identify where all their needs were. And um, actually one of our architect uh, companies pulled all of that information together brought that up to the state and the governor um, gave us one-time money of $439 million in one-time funds uh, for critical maintenance needs of public libraries and safety. Um, but the other ways that libraries have, have really reshaped the way that they've thought about their, their work, um, maker spaces, um, uh, highlight libraries ready to code and, and simulators and VR technology um, is used for all kinds of things like job training, such as in Nevada. I know that we've used VR here for even helping to identify um, uh, our, the better use of our public spaces. Um, areas for entrepreneurs, I've already mentioned that, um, dedicated work areas, studio recording equipment, learning all kinds of different technology. Um, the Libraries Build Biz Business Initiative released a playbook of best practices for libraries of all sizes and contexts to start or enhance programming for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, and then, you know, there are places specifically um, developed, especially in our rural areas, uh, for tele, uh, telehealth and telemed medicine. Um, many public libraries are just trying to maintain what they've already got. Um, many are dealing with leaky roofs or accessibility issues and faulty or in inadequate HVAC, um, an issue particularly important in, in light of the pandemic. Um, the the a Public Policy and Advocacy Office did an analysis of current needs assessments in nine states. Um, extrapolating from that data, um, they estimated it would take $32 billion to address the facility needs of America's public libraries. Um, the Build America's Libraries Act um, would have addressed those, those uh, facility issues in public libraries with funding for badly needed maintenance and reconstruction in the areas most in need. While it did not make um, the final cut, um, the staff at the Public Policy and Advocacy Office are working with con congressional staff everywhere mm -hmm. on possible reintroduction, reintroduction of that legislation. So we're very excited about that. Um, Congress created the Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund as part of the American uh, Rescue Act Plan of 2021 to enhance the overall quality of education, work, and telehealth. The Coronavirus Capital Projects Fund provided $10 billion in available funding for eligible states, territories, and tribal communities to ensure communities access to high quality broadband, including broadband infrastructure 
improvements. So those are just a few examples. And and that's all. That's it's true that that's just a few. There's there's certainly more going on, but but we only have limited time, unfortunately. But um, thanks for covering a lot of that that territory there, Patty. And um, yeah, I know that the office is looking at new ways to help advance what would have been accomplished at the federal level with the uh, Build America's Libraries Act and uh, looking forward to, um, to the, ne the next session here. But um, it, it would be just wonderful if we could have that kind of model at the federal level so that we could leverage the state funding that's often available through, through awesome. state libraries like California. I know here in Maryland, we have a capital projects grant through the Maryland State Library that helps leverage local funds. So it really does help a lot of these really overdue projects finally um, see the light of day. Yes. So um, we have another question here about how ALA actively engages with student members. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to share that LAS students actually make up 15% of ALA membership. And it's great to have the opportunity for ALA to build a relationship with students to support them through their entire career. That support takes place at two levels, through ALA as a global organization, and through our ALA step student chapters on campuses. ALA student chapter um, numbers um, over 60 throughout our various campuses and our student-led organizations in the US, Canada, and Puerto Rico. These groups provide leadership and programming opportunities on campus. And to complement that, ALA also provides a virtual platform for student members to connect with each other across North America, as well as quarterly networking events. We are starting to offer some education programs specifically for students um, and have great engagement opportunities across the association, including um, with our divisions and roundtables. Lastly, ALA has partnered with our state chapters to offer a discounted joint student membership, as, as Joe mentioned earlier. This makes engaging in all levels financially affordable for our student members and give them, gives them lots of opportunities to learn and build their network along the way. And, and Patty, I do see that there's a comment in the chat from, from Mega here at the um, UMI school. And um, she says that she loves the high school internship okay. programs and libraries. We need more of those. And yeah, we do. And it's just wonderful to see also um, libraries that host um, the um, MLIS um, students as well, that just those, those I, I know I benefited from actually getting to work in a library and then getting to do a field study in a different library. Those are just so valuable to get that real world experience. Absolutely. So um, I don't see any other questions at this point. So I think this is a, a good moment to turn things back over to uh, Keith and Ursula. So thank you, Patty, so much. I'm gonna do a virtual round of applause oh, thank and, you, and um, thank you so much for, for all your insights on, on some, some uh, um, really interesting uh, questions that people have asked. So Ursula, Keith, it's, it's all yours. So thank you so much for taking the time and Thank you so much for your enthusiasm too. And I feel like for our students and um, recent alumna, alumni that are listening, um, it's, it's just so wonderful to hear that there are so many opportunities to get involved and that it's not too soon um, and that there's a place for them um, to really start making impact um, in the field for a profession. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight and uh, brought your really great questions to um, add to the discussion. So hopefully we will see you next year. Um, and yeah, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>